Good evening, everybody. Uh, today we have a, um, a new um, uh, lecture um, presented by Dr. Uh, Omar uh, uh, regarding the emergencies in oncology patients. Um, uh, um, after the session, we will have the feedback form. Please don't forget to fill it and uh, send it back to us. Um, uh, and now we will, we will have the lecture with Dr. Omar. Uh, yes. Dr. Roman, please start. Thank you very much for that. Um, good more, good, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Omar al -Borai. I'm one of the internal medicine trainees year one, uh, health education in England Northwest. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, some emergencies in uh, oncology patients. And um, of course, there's uh, like a very big number of uh, oncological emergencies. I'll try to cover few of them today, and they will also uh, try to to help you to find yourself the way and to find the guidelines how to deal with this kind of patients, especially on the on calls, on night shifts when you have uh, lesser uh, level of support with you. Uh, unless you stabilize the until you stabilize the patient, and the patient will get seen in the next day by uh, oncology teams. Is it okay? So I'll start by sharing my screen now. And um, uh, one second, I've got some issues. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. OK, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. OK, definitely. You can uh, so yeah, today we're going to talk about some oncological emergencies. There are a lot of them. And uh, we're just trying to today to uh, discuss a few of them. Um, I would really appreciate if you can engage with me and uh, we can make the two way conversation and you tell me what your thoughts and how would you manage these patients? Uh, I picked today two of the most common um, emergencies uh, in oncology patients, but I will also show you how to find uh, the guidelines and what to do for the rest of the patients. And maybe we can do further lectures about the rest of the oncological emergencies. We can make, maybe we can make a series of, of that. So our ILOs for tonight, uh, by the end of this session, uh, I want uh, the, um, the attendance to be able to access the relevant guidelines for oncological emergencies and able to be confidently able to identify and stabilize the patients with uh, neutropenic sepsis and also able to identify and start the initial management of patients presenting with acute diarrhea. Again, oncology patients. So just a quick background. Uh, cancer is not uh, something uh, Maybe it's like it's bigger than you think. It's not something, uh, it's not a few cases in the UK. Actually, in the UK, between 2016 and 2018, there are almost 500 new patients with cancer diagnosed, and also mortality is a little bit high. So, we've got between 2017 and 2019, almost 170,000 patients died from cancer. Uh, but because here in the UK, we've got uh, proper uh, chemotherapy, uh, early surveillance and identification of cancers, we've got uh, good guidelines in terms of treatment and dealing with complications. So 50% of patients who were diagnosed with cancers, they managed to survive 14 years or more. Yeah, this uh, was in England, Wales, between 2010-2011. Okay, so. The first thing I'm going to introduce you uh, the UK uh, Oncological Nursing Society guidelines. It's very, very specific, very detailed, and very comprehensive for you. This kind of guidelines will help you. And uh, during your on calls, during your night shifts, when you've got a uh, few support around yourself, you will maybe in the clerking shift or even in the ICU or whatever, you've got a patient who's coming with severe. Uh, diarrhea, whatever the complication, diarrhea, neutropenic sepsis. Uh, so 
and you don't know what to do, um, your registrar most of the time will will not have like more uh, more information that you have. So here is, I'm just using Google here. You can uh, use Google UK ONS guidelines. You're going to go for the first uh, for the first link here. Make sure it's the BDF one. It will come for you. It will open um, a BDF which starts uh, like this. UK Oncology Initial Management Guidelines. And then you've got a very comprehensive index. So you've got most of the oncological emergencies. You can just click on any of them and it will show you a very detailed uh, guidance for how to deal with these patients. Okay. Uh, why I'm discussing it is here with you. I think there's a missing slide for that. Sorry. Uh, why am I discussing that? Because um, I had a few occasions when I was in the Clarking night team. Uh, basically, the night team in the medical oncology like consists of maybe four, five doctors in the maximum. Some of them would be covering the wards. Some of them would be doing the Clarking. So you get patients presenting with the ED. Uh, coming with neutropenic sepsis, uh, fever, signs of infection, and you find like you've got very low uh, white cell count or even before getting the, the white cell count, we'll discuss that as well. You've got other patients coming with acute severe diarrhea, maybe like 10 motions per day. Patients look very dehydrated. Because they are oncology patients, um, I know it's not, it's a very quite um, specific areas, so it needs proper um, practice and management because you don't know what to give in chemotherapy patients, what to give in immunotherapy patients. And um, most of us maybe were not exposed to this in proper exposure that give you the confidence to deal with these emergencies. However, what you need to do actually in your on call or in your work to cover is just to stabilize the patient and start the proper initial management. So you take the first step. You, you start the initial investigation, you start the global resuscitation, then the oncology team will identify the patient the next day and will take the management over from you. So you just need to do the right things and the right time. Uh, stop the patient's deterioration, make sure that you, um, you don't make any complications, then you're going to take it from there. So this guideline is basically directed towards who are not specialized in oncology, just to teach them, to support them, how to support these patients, how to stabilize these patients, you start the initial management, then we're going to take it from there. Okay, so I'm going to talk here about neutropenic sepsis, and I don't want to just to be talking there on my own. So I turned off my screen, and I want any one of you just to discuss how would you manage a patient with neutropenic sepsis? How do you suspect a patient with neutropenic sepsis and what would you do? Like if you are on, the, on your night shift, what's your thoughts about neutropenic sepsis and what would you do? Any thoughts? Yeah, go on, Martin. Yeah, uh, I think it's you will have the red flags of sepsis. Um, and uh, uh, an expected source of infection, uh, plus the neutral count should be, I think less than five hundred. If I'm if I'm not wrong. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is a definition well of neutropenic sepsis. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else got any thoughts about what would you do if you got a patient with this signs Mosin mentioned, and what would you do for that? Mm, okay, uh, let's go through it again. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. Yes, so as Mosin said, uh, we're going to, okay, first of all, just a background. Uh, patients with, okay, patients who, are, who received recently or are in, uh, currently receiving systemic anti-cancer survey or have previous history of hematological malignancies or malusubrations or bone marrow failure for any reason have got the potential risk or increased risk of neutropenic sepsis or, or what neutropenia neutropenia means uh, just like uh, generally low white cell count and uh, uh, 
Yeah, and of course, because they got low immune system, they will develop sepsis easier than other population. Just um, a quick overview of the post surgery. I'm not going to explain it in details, but you're going to explain it in very simple terms, as one of the hematologists explained it to me, that um, infection of one of the causes that can cause bile, uh, my, uh, bone marrow suppression. So if the patient has already got bile, uh, bone marrow suppression, because of chemotherapy or because of um, infiltration of bone marrow for any reason, you are at risk of getting this worse. And when it gets worse, it's because there's no immune system already in the first place, so, so these, this is how they develop the sepsis. So it's called neutropenic sepsis. Um, suspicion, yes, as Mohsen said. So you need to you you need to have very low threshold, very high levels of suspicion for neutropenic sepsis. You need to pick it up. How to pick it up? You get a patient who is again a history of uh, cancers on chemotherapy, history of uh, bone marrow suppression. Uh, bone marrow transplant on uh, any kind of uh, anti or um, immunosuppressant treatment. Someone coming with signs and symptoms of infection, you might identify septic, uh, septic, septic focus, you might not, um, but the patient will be like, generally tired, feverish, you know, all the investigation, all the symptoms for, uh, uh, for infection. Then some of them may present with some already investigations arranged by the GB, arranged by the oncology team as an outpatient. Maybe the investigations already did be done in the ED. Some of them may have not uh, got the investigations yet. The rule here, if you got suspicion of neutropenic sep se se sepsis, you need to take bloods and start antibiotics immediately. You don't need to wait for the full blood count result. You can start, you can start the first dose of the antibiotics awaiting the further results. But don't delay uh, delivering treatment for these patients just because you're waiting for the results of your investigations. And the rule here say like door to needle um, time shouldn't be more than an hour. So in one hour, patient presenting to the front door of the INE, I know this like this is a guideline rule and it never happens in the NHS now, the patient can wait in the corridors for 12 hours. But the ideal rule is needle to time, uh, door to needle time shouldn't, should be less than one hour. So our approach here, we, okay, so you identified this patient and you suspected the uh, neutropenic sepsis. And then now what should you do? You've started all these antibiotics and we're going to speak about the antibiotics later. Um, most of the time, the, the antibiotics is um, according to the trust guidelines, different from a trust, uh, from a trust to a trust. But just as a general rule of thumb, you start uh, tazosin, then you uh, you uh, you change your antibiotics later, according to the cultures. So you start as any any approach for any other patient. You start by taking proper history, try to identify the patient's symptoms, try to correlate it with any potential source of infection and sepsis, then using the score will be very important here because you're going to stabilize the baseline or the initial using score. You're going, you're going to monitor that later. You start your normal A to E approach again. Uh, uh, make sure the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, um, and exposure. Uh, and you treat according while you're going through them, and you try to identify your septic uh, focus. Start immediate resuscitation, so whatever it's needed. So if it's cyst infection, the patient or an oxygen, you might give them some supplemental oxygen. IV fluids are important, and we we know all of this stuff. Then investigations. So this kind of patient, you need to do detailed investigations a little bit. So rather than uh, more like after the routine bloods you're going to take for blood count, CRB, um, UNEs, LFTs, you need also to have a look on the magnesium, you need to have a look on the bone profile, including uh, the calcium and phosphate. Yeah, basically, you're just monitoring all the electrolytes. And in these patients, also, you need to get cultures. Fluid, um, blood cultures are very important. And ideally, it needs to be started before giving the first dose of the antibiotics. So when the patient come, you will take the investigation, take the culture and start antibiotics immediately. Whole systemic anti-cancer therapy until get reviewed by um, oncology team. 
is very most of the of the oncology uh, the oncology patient um, the oncology team will uh, stop this uh, systemic anti cancer therapy until the patient gets well then they can start it again uh, so you can st you can stop it yourself overnight or over the weekend until you get reviewed by them then after that uh, you will need to uh, initiate the monitoring plan for this patient i know in in ICU, for example, the, the using score is not uh, doesn't work there, uh, and um, there's already some hourly there's already hourly review of the patient's uh, observations, but this doesn't happen on the ward. So you need to put in your plan that this patient will need daily UNEs and electrolytes for blood count, CRP, and you need to, the patient at least to have using uh, new scores at least six hourly to monitor the patient's progression. Then further investigations will need to be arranged as well. So now after stabilizing the patient, after doing your A to E approach, you might have identified your septic focus, you started antibiotics, you are taking your cultures, you started the res proper resuscitation, you hold the sac. So patient might need further investigations to identify the potential source of infection. So for this patient, um, you might need some swabs, uh, like if the patient got any wounds, no wound swab, um, um, throat swabs, uh, there's something called rapid GI panel, which is a swab, rectal swab. It can find loads of um, agents, especially to really, the thing will be helpful, helpful in um, diarrhea. A stool sample, urine culture, and of course, if the patient, many patients got um, big lines or mid uh, or mid lines. Uh, if the patient got a central line, you will need a culture from the central line and a preferred culture. So you need to get culture from both sides. And to see, I think to examine the, um, the site of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the line carefully for any signs of infection or cellulitis or line infection. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's it for uh, the neutropenic sepsis patients. Has anyone got any questions? Yes, I have a question here. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Mohsen first. Okay. You, you you are muted, uh, Dr. Mohsen. You're still mute. You're still mute. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. Thanks, Omar. Uh, so just a, a comment about the uh, line-related sepsis in general, uh, not for, not specifically for neutropenic patients. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's like a common sense that everybody will look at the site of the line to diagnose line related infection. Just bear in mind. Uh, the site infection is cellulitis. But if it's absent, it doesn't exclude line related sepsis. Because the line is, you know, going towards a, a central or a peripheral vein and there might be colonization at the tip of the line, but not causing cellulitis at the site of infection. So in this case, you will have to take paired cultures and depend on them uh, before easily examining the site of insertion and excluding line related uh, sepsis. So it's yeah. just one of the comments which we face commonly in ICU. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, yeah, that was just us to uh, one of the microbiology consultants. Yeah, the paired cultures, and then if there's any suspicion of the of line infection, you need to take the whole line out and send the culture for the tip for cultures. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Um, Mahmoud Mustafa. Yeah, I, I just had a question about um, the whole sac thing. Um, you said it's anti cancer survey. What does it mean? Uh, anti cancer, uh, systemic anti cancer therapy. Oh, OK. The chemotherapy, basically. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how oncology people like to call it. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Um, lastly, my, my question. And um, the fact that this patient is neutropenic, does the patient needs to be isolated so to prevent any chest infection or something like this? Yes, yes. The patient needs to be isolated in a side room uh, because they are a higher risk of catching an infection from the hostel. 
So I think the guys, mm -hmm. the local protocols, I'm in our trust here, all the patients with uh, neutropenic sepsis or suspected any kind of immunosuppression, they will yes. need to be activated with hydrogen. Seems to be logic, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, regarding the SACT thing, I think uh, the SACT uh, systemic anti cancer therapy because it's a broader term to cover chemotherapy and immunotherapy and uh, the other biological um, uh, agents. That's why they put in the term SACT. SACT. Okay. And uh, I'm just before we go, uh, again, I'm going to just quickly show you the guidelines for it. I'll show you how helpful is it and how it takes you from a step to step before we move to the next topic. Okay. So this is a guideline again. Um, if you click, this is a guideline I showed to you. If you click here on neutrobenic sepsis, uh, show you everything so it will show you the antibiotics what to give and how to rapidly uh, resuscitate the patient and what to do in day one day two but you don't need to do that you just like you do the first one uh, the initial management and oncology uh, team will get will take care of the patient later okay so next one is uh, we're going to speak about uh, acute diarrhea again patients uh, presenting with uh, acute diarrhea in onco uh, oncology patients presenting with acute diarrhea um, would you please discuss or express your thoughts about that? What do you think might be the cause? What what might not be the cause and what would you do about that? Anyone got any? They can come to ICU as well because it can be hypotensive or dehydrated. Yes, yeah. Dr. Marson has a question. Yeah, I think the, the first one oh. would be infective diarrhea. As you said, they are prone to infection, immunocompromised. Um, I'm not sure if it can be a side effect of the chemotherapy itself. It can be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, might be related to the cancer itself as well. Yes. Maybe electrolyte uh, imbalance as well. Yeah, most common complication. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? Yeah, can be, yeah, I think that's it. And can be one of the side effects of the chemotherapy. Immunotherapy can cause colitis. And it can be patients, hematology, uh, hematology patients, as they got the transplant, can be graft versus host disease. Okay, so let's go through that and see. Uh, you can see my screen now, can you? One second. Okay, so acute diarrhea. Uh, there's some detailed uh, classification of acute diarrhea uh, in the guideline, but I think the approach would be similar anyway. So if you get a patient admitted with acute diarrhea, you need again to take the history from the patient. Uh, you need to assess the patient with the new thing score. New score just help you to, to see how severely ill is the patient. A to E approach and you resuscitate appro uh, accordingly. Um, again, you need to arrange some investigations and here besides, again, besides the routine bloods, you need to focus on the electrolyte imbalance. So UNEs, make sure that you get the magnesium, get bone, propyl and phosphates. If the patient got any abdominal pain, you need to get an, an abdominal x-ray. Stool culture is essential here and GI panel. GI panel is just basically a swab that can test uh, BCR for multiple organisms, including uh, protozoa, some uh, viruses, and uh, some bacterial uh, causes of uh, stool. The differential diagnosis in patients coming with, uh, with diarrhea in oncology, it's quite wide. I just picked a few of them here. So graft versus host disease is one of the common ones in hematology patients. Side effect of uh, systemic anti chemo uh, anti cancer therapy side effect of immunotherapy again as we said uh, colitis infection as Mawson said radiotherapy and any radiotherapy directed towards um, the abdominal pelvic area 
mm -hmm. can cause uh, diarrhea. It can be constipation with overflow diarrhea as well. So again, uh, we, we just need to initiate the initial management. We need to stabilize the patient. Then the hematology team will, will take care of it, will uh, we'll take over the care. So of course, we start with IV fluid resuscitation, electrolyte correction. Uh, of course, you hold again the systemic anti-cancer therapy and are waiting for the oncology review. In most of the cases, the oncology team or the patient looks unwell. You just stop the chemotherapy, you can defer the cycle for one or two weeks until the patient recovers, then they can restart it. You need here, uh, in the guidelines, they mentioned that you need to consider the infective course, but you don't need to assume that it's only infective course. So just consider the course as infection. Okay, and if you think uh, it's an infection cause, if you suspect C. diff, you can start empirical uh, antibiotic for that. That would be the oral vancomycin. Uh, before you get the result of the stool culture or be, before you get the result of your investigation. So you can start treatment uh, empirically. In this patients, you need to review the patient's medication. This patient is um, someone who's um, hypotensive, uh, dehydrated, most likely will develop an AKI. Imagine someone got diarrhea like 10 motions per day or more. So uh, ideally we need here to review the patient, all the patient's medications, hold anything that can cause hypotension like NSAIDs or calcium channel blockers, sorry, um, uh, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers. NSAIDs can cause, um, NSAIDs here can cause an, um, an AKI. So if the patient is already an AKI, hold the NSAIDs as well. Uh, and what else, yeah. Uh, consider anti-diarrheal uh, medication. So if you manage to exclude the, um, the infective cause, so if you suspect that this patient, for example, has got Im immunotherapy and most probably the diagnosis here would be uh, immune therapy related uh, colitis with um, diarrhea as a complication. So you can start lopramide and uh, usually start lopramide uh, four milligrams and you can add with PR in lubramide two milligrams after every motion until you get that controlled. If it's not controlled, you've got codeine phosphate as a reasonable option as well. Um, if the patient got abdominal pain, you need to get an X-ray first to make sure that there is no kind of obstruction or any ab um, abdominal emergencies, and you can give the patient some hyacin. Consider neutropenic sepsis here as well uh, for your investigations or your clinical suspicion from the past um, slides, uh, you get suspicion of neurotrophic sepsis, graft versus host disease. In, only in this case, you won't do much for the patient. You don't even give lopramide. You need to discuss with the hematology and call patients. So make sure that you, um, if you've got a patient who recently received some uh, bone marrow transplant, or if you get any kind of suspicion of graft versus host disease, you don't start anti diarrheal medications and you need to call the hematology first. And uh, yes, so that's how simple is it. I know you can, thank you for today. I know you can see um, it's not much done, but actually it's one of the topics that for me, myself, and for a lot of my colleagues, um, medical teams and surgical teams, what happens is when you Can you see me? Yeah. What happens yes. when you see an oncology patient on the ward, or if you got a patient on the on the ED, uh, someone coming with neutrophilic sepsis, someone coming with acute diarrhea, the emotion, e, you panic, and you don't know what to do. But this is how simple it is. I, in purpose, I just I I made it very simple, and I just showed you the guidelines. You don't need to do much for this patient. Uh, on my own calls, um, it happened to me, and it happened to my colleagues. And even when you ask the medical registrar on call, who's like, he's the one who knows everything for, as, for me as a junior, or even for other specialties, surgeons will call the medical registrar for everything. It can be quite complicated and you don't know what to do. Even the medical registrar will, wouldn't know what to do, but they will guide you for the guidelines. And that's what happens to me on a night shift. Like I've got a patient with um, this severe diarrhea. We didn't know what to do. I asked the midrash, she didn't know what to do. But then she told me like try these guidelines and actually it was very helpful 
you don't need to do much for the patient. You're not going to fix everything in one day. We've got, we've got already um, a cancer running by there. We've, got, we've already got the chemotherapy cycles. You just need to stabilize the patient. And what you do, if it's very simple things, but it will do a lot for the patient. And um, the most important thing now, you see how simple is it for managing intravenous sepsis and diarrhea. And you can now access the, the guidelines. So hopefully, in future sessions, we can discuss more. But if you got any of these patients on your own calls, if you meet any of them on your ward, on your workplace, I think you will be able at least to find the guidelines and help yourself with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar and Borai. Um, it was a very interesting overview lecture regarding the emergencies and um, uh, oncology patients. Um, everybody of us actually uh, at some points will will find himself in front of one of these patients. Um, uh, any questions from my colleagues? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Mason. You are you're muted again. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. So it's probably my mouse. Uh, could you please put the link for the guidelines on the uh, chat box or the WhatsApp group? Actually, the group will I, be better. Yeah. In the sessions, uh, in the in the in the first slides, I didn't want to put a link for you because you might lose the link. But I show it to you here. Like you just need to write uh, in Google. You can you can do it later yourself. Because I know the link. But some some of my colleagues gave me the link for that. But you might lose the link, or you might on your own call just mm -hmm. find the link. Uh, mm -hmm. One second. So here I'll show it to you again. You, didn't, you don't need to do much for uh, to find the guidelines. What you actually need, want to do is you just go to Google. Here I'm writing UK. Just write UK ONS guidelines. And you find mm. the link with the PDF. And that's it. Yes, it's easy. It's as easy yeah. as it is. And you, and you can use the PDF offline, isn't it? Yes, you can download the PDF offline. Excellent. So you can download it on your computer. You can put it in your phone. But it's mm -hmm. as simple as writing your UK in ONS guidelines on Google and just open the, the PDF link. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Any other questions? OK. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Omar. Um, um, please, uh, my colleagues, don't forget to fill the feedback form so everybody will get um, uh, his um, certificate and um, the uh, CDB points. Um, thank you very much and see you soon in another lecture next week. Uh, thank the, you. The feedback form is in the chat now and yes. uh, it's also in the group. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Bye bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.